This episode for International Women's Day was recorded remotely via video conferencing software. So stay tuned for a discussion on on equity in healthcare and how we can build better communication, trust and rapport between healthcare workers and Muslim women. Welcome to this International Women's Day podcast and I'm talking today to Rida Khan. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, yes you did. Perfect. Can you give us a, a little bit of background on the work that you've done? Uh, sure. Firstly, thank you so much for inviting me uh, here, Mia. Um, I also would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we are on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge my ancestors, the Baluch people that have served Australia since um, 1860. So, yeah, we appreciate all of their hard work and um uh, now to my introduction. Um, I am a social worker. I run a small um, initiative known as the South Asian Women Network and Allies, uh, SAVNA. And um, it's basically a network of South Asian women um, in Australia, a place where we can have an intellectual playground, discuss issues affecting um, women from multicultural backgrounds, South Asian backgrounds, as well as interfaith backgrounds. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the unique needs and concerns that Muslim women have, which health professionals should consider just as a foundation to build this discussion on? Sure. Um, For example, when we look at Muslim women's health, one of the primary and most relevant um, issue would be accessing reproductive health. Sometimes, and to my surprise, actually, a lot of the fertility clinics around Melbourne actually have only male doctors. Um, That then creates this a whole range of issues like because in Islam or it from for just for the sake of explaining this to the audience um, uh, in Islam like we prefer the same gender interaction so if it's my husband he'll be interacting with a male doctor if it's me I will be interacting with a female doctor um, and that is still a little bit accessible um, at a GP level so when you're accessing general practitioners or if you're accessing like a woman dentist or a man dentist, like you can get that. But when it comes down to specialists, oh, it's hard. Uh, firstly, there's a long waiting list if, you know, you prefer someone from the same gender. Um, and B, if suppose they have something specific, like they're specialized, like suppose there's a gynecologist and or obstetrician who's specializing in a specific um, issue that you're experiencing um, in with regards to your reproductive health. Uh, the waiting list is so long and she's often not available. And also, even if your, your case is referred, it's up to the specialist to decide whether they will take your case or not. And generally speaking, there aren't that many Muslim specialists out there, <laughs> especially when it comes down to reproductive health. Just expanding on the topic of reproductive health, I understand that there are unique concerns around undergoing IVF to conceive children or surrogacy, if you're a Muslim woman, there's certain unique issues pertaining to that. Is that right? That is correct. Um, So when it comes down to Islamic faith, for example, surrogacy is a big no for a whole range of reasons. And it's not just the Islamic perspective. It's also given, you know, Muslims come from various cultures. Many cultures across the globe that Muslims come from, uh, they do not adhere to this idea of surrogacy. Um, In Islam, for example, Women don't change their names after marriage. They need to know which tribe I'm from, to know which, what is my bloodline. They need to know the baby's maternal lineage in order to understand who, who the mother is. So if I have a child and my husband have a child through surrogacy, who, whose child is it? Is it that of the woman who gave birth or is it mine? Because, um, yeah, like it, it confuses things. But on the other hand, Muslim couples may consider having, like, say, a husband may consider having a second wife. And that creates another problem because Australia doesn't recognize polygamous marriages. And so it, it, the entire, like, you know, the reproductive health system is like, oh, we want to help couples conceive, except their methods are not Islamic or the way they want conception to happen, like through sperm donors, no, that's that's another thing that's not allowed in Islam. Whose sperm is it? So the whole thing comes down to 
the family name, your tribal lineage, and your bloodline. If they cannot identify it, then it's, they're not going to do it. So if a Muslim woman is struggling with infertility, what are her options and what can medical professionals do to support them? Um, I think, firstly, we need to understand there isn't enough translation of resources for Muslim women to access online. And not all Muslims speak Arabic, for the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> Only 15% of the people in the yeah. Muslim world speak Arabic. Everyone else speaks other languages like Bangla, like Urdu, Hindi. Not everyone <laughs> speaks Arabic. Um, the other thing is, I, I think we also need to understand the stigma around infertility. I don't even think that word should be used when treating Muslim couples because the inherently Islamic belief is that there is a plan that Allah has for everybody and a child can be conceived at any point in time. Uh, there is a story that we, I think, speak of Prophet Joseph. One of the prophets, uh, don't quote me on this, but basically one of the prophets in Islam who was very old, God said to him that, you know, you will have a baby. And he's like, but I'm so old and my wife is so old. How will we have a baby? And But then they did have a baby. So and therefore, I think that story in Abrahamic religions, I think it exists to motivate couples that are undergoing reproductive health issues. More importantly, I think that. Uh, the issue of infertility has a lot more to do with men than women in this mm. day and age. Um, and I think that the focus on Muslim women is a wrong focus when it comes down to uh, conception issues. Yeah, interesting. And I guess reproductive challenges is a better term than infertility. Correct. Yes, yeah. that's, I, I like that. Yes, ma'am. Mm. that's great. Yeah. Is there any health misinformation that Muslim women face? We were talking on the phone earlier about wellness influencer types, which I think is very interesting because I've seen a lot of wellness influencer types from Anglo content makers on social media. Yeah, that's a new trend that we're getting. Um, And I want to just kind of also point out uh, before we get, get too deep into the podcast that if Muslim women are experiencing such challenging issues, in Melbourne or in Sydney, imagine how much worse it would be for Muslim women living in rural areas. That's just to, to point that out. Now let's go to the, the, the topic that you're referring to, the, these new age experts from YouTube and um, on TikTok and, and Instagram. And it all starts off as this, it's all about the energies in your body that you need to balance. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bad at imitating them. But the point is, if you are a Muslim couple or a Muslim family or a Muslim woman, if you have any questions regarding uh, sex health, sex education, and there isn't a lot of information out there available for you, then you're kind of left with new age experts from overseas. Uh, a lot of them are from United States. A lot of them are from uh, countries that are developing and um, a lot of them are also, I guess, trying to sell a product. They are sponsored by certain businesses um, mm. who want them to, you know, promote a particular product, whether it's a drug in the market, like for weight loss or uh, to get rid of um, excessive hair. I mean, it could be anything that they could be selling. If not, it, it may not be approved by the Australian pharmaceutical standards. It may not be approved by Australian Medical Board. However, they are out there. Yeah, and are they Muslim women? Do you see that? Because some of these drugs or medications are not approved by Western medical standards, they are then fallen into the hands of developing countries and poorer countries where they are basically, you know, exploited. These businesses, they are paying them to promote this, and that marketer could be a famous Muslim woman who does her makeup on Instagram and YouTube because the business is you know, paying them and they're desperate because, you know, they're trying to build a career. Um, I think a lot of Muslim women, they, they do fall for it. And there's also that, you know, the other thing uh, we got to understand is that people believe in the word of mouth. Uh, if I've heard that, say, a friend of mine in Pakistan have had managed to re- uh, conceive a child because of a particular drug she used, 
I may do everything in my power to actually access that drug. So even if I can't buy it myself in Australia, I may get my auntie in Pakistan to purchase it for me and post it to me in Australia, to Australia. And, and therefore I think there is definitely, uh, we do fall for all these so-called internet experts. Uh, but on the other hand, I kind of don't blame them because what's the alternative? We, we don't, the mainstream healthcare system is so orthodox and so westernized and so white woman matriarchy that it's just, you know, you might as well just go with the things that you're getting. And, and mm. what's a potential solution to address the misinformation out there for Muslim women? What would you recommend? I, I think, uh, I, and yes, there is, yeah, language translations that, yeah, not all Muslims speak Arabic for the love of God. We, they speak multiple languages and, and there are new and emerging communities for whom we need to translate resources for. Uh, number two, um, there are more than 47 Islamic school of thoughts. Uh, and everyone has different ruling regarding different medical issues. You as a healthcare professional need to study them. Take bloody responsibility because mm-hmm. you should. It shouldn't be up to Muslims to educate healthcare professionals. It should be part of their inherent medical curriculum at universities, at TAFE. It should not be up to the patients to teach them how to treat them. It, mm-hmm. Yes, you, you know, like we get this a very base. Oh, we need to respect everybody's beliefs. Yeah, but like you, that doesn't help me. A social worker, you know, I already know how to respect people since I was in primary school. You know, I need more. You know, pick five or six communities, interfaith communities of Australia and, you know, at least teach what their, uh, you know, faith and medical rulings are. Uh, thirdly, we need, we really need to acknowledge the white matriarchy and, and we need to, you know, kind of make space for not just multicultural women, but Muslim women specifically. I would love to see a Muslim woman medical association. I would love to see a Muslim woman healthcare network. And fourthly, we need, if we don't have something in Australia, well then, you know, reach out overseas doctors and overseas healthcare professionals. You know, if you don't have resources or if you don't have the funding to create resources, stop being lazy. Not that hard. Like, mm. for example, I'll tell you like about AIDS and HIV AIDS. There's already enough programs by World Health Organization and United Nations in the world for uh, in, in various, you know, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim countries across the globe. So there's lots we can do, Mia. But again, it's all about the leadership and whether they want to. We were talking a little bit earlier about uh, religious stereotyping. So... Muslim women may be perceived as uneducated or oppressed. Medical professionals might assume that they're not capable of making informed healthcare decisions for themselves. Is there any discrimination and stereotyping from healthcare providers towards Muslim women apart from that? Uh, absolutely. And you know, that this is one of the saddest things. There are doctors in this country that you may think are, you know, suppose I'm a Pakistani Muslim woman. And I thought maybe it's a good idea to go to a South Asian healthcare professional in Australia because they share some of my culture and they may even speak my language. Um, and, you know, it will be good to go to them only to realize that the person I'm talking to is a Hindu fascist who is, you know, a Zionist and we hate Muslims. And therefore, anything I say, any of my, my problem becomes secondary. It's, it's all about, oh, tell me more about jihad. Well, what does mm. that got to do with, I mean, come on. Well, and, and also the, it's not just the assumption that Muslim women are oppressed or dumb. It's, it's the assumption that we are unhappy with our husbands. Mm. Oh my God. It's like, there must be some issue. There must be something wrong, like with our religion or we, or, or, or our inherent way of living that we are experiencing health issues rather than the other way around. That it's because of this health issue that I'm struggling to cope with my family or or my with my children or my everyday life they make it more about no 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 it's because maybe perhaps you're oppressed or maybe because you know your faith limits you maybe because you have been brainwashed to believe this that's why you have depression i mean are you kidding me um you mentioned earlier about putting efforts towards providing health literacy information towards muslim men to make it Muslim women's lives easier and keeping that in mind with the fact that you don't want to assume that it's the husbands who are making the women depressed. 
how does supporting men's health help ease the weight for Muslim women? I'm curious about that. Sure. Um, I, I'll actually just use my husband as an example. My husband doesn't believe that he can call Beyond Blue or uh, Lifeline down to accessing, you know, mental health support. And I asked him once. I'm like, why? Why? Why don't you need? Uh, why don't you call? Why don't you believe in these helplines? He's like, they just talk. They're just re- constantly repeating what I'm saying. Like if I tell them I'm depressed, they're like. You sound like you are depressed, but <laughs> well, duh. And there's a lot of this, like the telephone uh, services or the telehealth services, you know, which became very popular during the pandemic. They're not helping. The cognitive behavior therapy should be t- should be happening in that session. Instead, the helpline is more about just repeating whatever the other person is saying. And that's- Validating. Yeah, that's just a big well, emphasis, yeah. That's right. And and that's not what they want to do. Like Muslim men, they want to know like, okay, man, my mm-hmm. wife is unhappy with me because I forgot what, some, to get her something on Valentine's Day. I'm just giving this as an example. Yeah. Yeah, he is trying to seek help, but the response is more of the same. It's not necessarily catering to the needs of his problem. And one of the key barriers that Western medical model has is that they keep telling these graduates, you can't make decisions on behalf of their clients, which is true. However, you also don't give them any options. So on one hand, I understand that you as a service provider cannot tell me what to do. And when you don't even receive options, then it starts getting very frustrating and Muslim men, they would just give up. And frankly, that's been the case since 9-11. Muslim people are left on their own to deal with Islamophobia and bigotry. Like there's still no law in this country that actually punishes Islamophobia. There's no penalty for Islamophobia. The other issue is also like, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, going to imams, uh, they are older in, in age and it's very hard to listen to their advice. Their advice is so religious sometimes that it's not necessarily focusing on the problem. It's focusing too much on the faith. And mm. yes, we want to pray. You know, you need to pray. You should do charity and you should, uh, you know, uh, pray more. And it's like I am I, already doing all those things. So I do feel that if we can start catering to the needs of Muslim men, even have a round table for Muslim men's health or have a conference on on Muslim men's health or create a network of of Muslim men health practitioners working together with Muslim men. This is how serious uh, this issue is. Like I said, we could could be doing so much more. Uh, I see we have a mental health month around October. I never see any conversation around Muslim men's mental health. Uh, mm. I've never seen a not even a single workshop being advertised by any of the service providers regarding that. And I think they are simply invisible in the system. I'm so glad I brought up the point about this Muslim men's health because I feel like, you know, sometimes Muslim women can keep going back to the system, calling counseling services or reproductive health clinics or keep seeing women doctors. But that doesn't do the job when your other half, your other partner isn't being supported at all by the system. And it's basically, you know, left up to the woman to drive her well-being of the house. And, and that's not, not fair because both people need to be in the right headspace to make sure that the family is doing okay. Thank you, Rita, for joining me today. And thanks again for providing so much value and information to our listeners. No worries, Mia. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope you found this discussion with Rita to be informative. Rita shared a lot of thoughts on Western healthcare systems and the theme of equity. It's important to address the unique challenges faced by Muslim women in order to meet the diverse healthcare needs of everyone in Australia. This has been an episode to commemorate International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day, everybody. And thank you for listening.